Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, afternoon uh, session. Um, I, uh, if it looks like I'm uncomfortable, uh, it's because I'm gonna be um, uh, sucking it in and flexing the whole time. I'm sitting between two uh, Olympians. Uh, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'm intimidated uh, by uh, both of these incredible women. Uh, we are going to take uh, a minute as part of this discussion to talk about uh, sport uh, as well. Um, and we are trying uh, here to imagine our way to the desired future state that we have uh, in uh, what we do with our bodies and the food and fluid that we put into our bodies are huge determining factors in our wellness. Um, so uh, it's a huge honor uh, to be sitting between the two of you and thank you for taking the time. Uh, to share some of your wisdom uh, with the audience here. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce both of them, uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to start with our dear friend, uh, Wanik. Uh, okay, here it goes, the, the a bio. Wanik Horn-Miller, uh, one of my all-time favorite human beings. Uh, I applied for um, the presidency of the Wanik fan club, um, and apparently there's a several year waiting list. So I'm in there at some point, 2025 or something like that, if my time comes up. Uh, Mohawk uh, from the Ganawagi uh, Mohawk Territory near Montreal, behind the lines during the Oka crisis in 1990. Uh, she um, appeared on the cover of Time Magazine, which we heard uh, earlier, uh, in her role as co-captain of uh, Canada's Olympic water polo team. Um, and she has worked to attract youth to higher education by building self-esteem and emphasizing the balance between education and sports. Wanique is the assistant chef de mission for Team Canada at the 2015 Pan Am Games. Um, and uh, she also teamed up with the Aboriginal People's Television Network and health experts to launch a fitness and health eating initiative called Working It Out Together, which follows six Mohawks on their pursuit of better health. She is also an ambassador for Manitoba Mutlucks, which we're gonna hear a little bit about uh, today. The world famous Canadian Aboriginal footwear brand that has been worn by Kate Moss, Jessica Beale, and Megan Fox. Um, she was recently named um, in the top 100 most influential women in sport by the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport. Uh, something that was really exciting for me um, at the North American Indigenous Games for which uh, Team BC won the medal count uh, and the Team Spirit Award, which is the first time in the history of the North American Indigenous Games that both awards were won by uh, one team. Uh, Wadi was uh, the host, co-host with Michael Hutchison um, and it's so groovy to, uh, to go to some of my favorite places on TV and to see uh, this incredible role model um, and to be um, uh, also for my daughter, Raven, here, uh, just to be such an example uh, for our young women of that balance between uh, strength and beauty and excellence and integrity and stamina. And uh, so, um, so I'm very happy on the stage with you, and uh, welcome, and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and to uh, Michelle Stillwell. So Michelle, uh, as you'll hear, uh, represents um, the peak of the innovation in the government of British Columbia, being the first um, jurisdiction in Canada to have a Minister of Social Innovation. Uh, she is also the only cabinet minister in this entire country that uh, took the time to travel here uh, to Winnipeg uh, to spend this time. Uh, government's a busy place. People are busy. They say I'm busy. And when uh, Minister Stillwell was invited, um, she said yes, absolutely. And uh, that, I think, uh, is an excellent example of the kind of commitment that we're going to need to move this forward and to be able to shake hands with governments, such a crucial partner uh, with our ability to make change in our communities. Uh, Michelle is an elected member of the legislature in British Columbia. 
Um, and as I've uh, mentioned, uh, not just social innovation, uh, but also social development, uh, including persons with disabilities um, and income assistance as to uh, other significant focuses uh, in her ministry. Determination, perseverance, and discipline are three qualities that truly capture the strength and character of this dynamic politician, Canadian athlete, and Olympian. When I first met uh, Minister Stilwell, I was uh, nervous and slid a paper over that said, can I please have your autograph? We were in a meeting. <laughs> so uh, like, I was, I was uh, bringing it for the Friendship Centers. And uh, um, at that time, I understood that she had won uh, Olympic gold medals in two different sports at the Paralympic Games. And she will also be going to Rio to compete in the upcoming Olympics. Fingers crossed. Uh, Michelle's story speaks to the power of focus and how this can make a winner out of anybody. It was her love of competition and sport that helped her regain confidence in her abilities post-injury. Since then, her passion to compete has been her vehicle to success in all aspects of life. Michelle is passionate about healthy, active living and advocates for people with disabilities and children with special needs. She has been an ambassador, spokesperson, business owner, and continues to train and compete on the international stage. Michelle's determination, perseverance, and discipline has allowed her to triumph over every obstacle on her journey to success, purely for the fact that the, she does not see limits, only challenges and opportunities. Um, Michelle is also a mother, a cabinet minister, and active uh, actively trains. She was in Toronto this past summer uh, and also won two gold medals. One gold medal at the, at the Para Pan Am Games uh, that just happened uh, this past summer in Toronto. So absolutely incredible, uh, both of these incredible women. And so I'm really, truly honored to be able to sit on the stage. <laughs> Minister, Minister, yes, awesome. I've been so looking forward to this uh, opportunity and to hear your uh, thoughts uh, generally about uh, social innovation, the opportunity in the space, uh, and some of your opening reflections. So I'm going to look to you for our first comments. Well, well, thank you, Paul, and I know I've certainly been looking forward to it as well, and I can tell you that there is an opening in my fan club for president, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so I'm really excited to be here and, and you know, to share in this opportunity for us to come together and to share stories that uh, tell the, the stories of social innovation that is happening across Canada, that is happening not only in British Columbia, you'll hear me say it several times in the next few minutes that we are leading the way in British Columbia uh, with social innovation, but this is really an opportunity for us to get together and to learn from each other and find the common ground that brings us together, especially when we're looking at Indigenous innovation. I was thinking before I came here what I wanted to share and talk about. And obviously, when I became Minister of Social Innovation, the only minister in, British, or in Canada for social innovation, it was a big job for me because as we talked this morning, I had to look up what social innovation meant as well. I had to do some homework, but one of my first trips was actually up to Prince George where I first met Paul and he asked for my autograph. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was at the Gathering Our Voices in Prince George in northern BC where it's cold, not quite as cold as Winnipeg at this time, but um, that, that event brought together Aboriginal youth uh, together so that they could learn and they could laugh and they could share their wisdom and their stories with each other and talk about what the future looked like and what it held for them. And really, the event itself is a model of social innovation. It's uh, that cross-generational and arts-based learning that can take place. It also had this Dragon's Den style of social enterprise where they featured a few different social enterprises from Prince George and they brought the Aboriginal youth entrepreneurs on stage so that they could market 
their businesses and share their ideas of and their business plan for success and looking into how they can make that great social impact for their community and um, they identified solutions and I think that's critical in our discussion as we move forward with social, social innovation. It really is about the solutions that we can use to solve these critical social problems that we see. So there was one company and that was um, the Smokehouse Kitchen, which is based out of the Prince George Native Friendship Center, which Paul is very, very familiar with. But the Smokehouse provides employment training for uh, the, the individuals who, who gain employment there so that they can get the skills and the training that they need so that they can then find other employment and move on to success and find greater independence for themselves. And it was really incredible for me uh, as the minister for the first time to really see the impact that the smokehouse was having for, for so many, mostly women that I met that day, but for the participants to, to see them, it was empowering for me to see how they were gaining confidence and they were um, having the ability to share with each other their stories, to support each other from their past and the I don't want to say baggage, but the, the stuff that they were bringing with them and the things, the barriers that were standing in their way which were limiting them from moving forward and finding that greater independence and to see them in a, a role where they had that ability to uh, work together collaboratively while gaining that confidence, while gaining the skills that they need. It was really um, so beautiful to see how that social innovation was having such an impact on not only the individuals but on the community because the kitchen has its catering business which then delivers services to the community and that revenue then comes back into the Friendship Center. So to see social innovation have such a great impact in multiple ways, helping support socially, helping to, to facilitate the finances to run the programs through the Friendship Center while serving the community with the catering business, it's, it's one of those social enterprises that was presented that night, it, it was really about those new ideas and those solutions and the perspectives that, that we need to move forward with social innovation. And it's really what social innovation is all about. And when we talk about, you know, I'm here as the government representative, which is really a sometimes difficult role for me to take on. But really when you look at government, it's about how do we facilitate social change? How does government play a role in that? How do we solve the issues like climate change or sustainability or homelessness or poverty? They're not situations or issues that government can solve alone. And when we look at anything that we do in life, it really is, it always comes back to community and the grassroots and the people at the core who come together and work together and collaborate to find solutions to the issues that are, are troubling communities. It's really about how we together work in new and innovative ways to find solutions. We have to transcend the boundaries of municipal or provincial lines or uh, business sectors, cultural backgrounds, whatever it may be, whether it's the nonprofits coming in to, to help support in other ways. We have to look over those things and see what those barriers are that are standing in our way to find those opportunities so that we can support and stimulate innovation around British Columbia and around Canada and all our communities. And I can certainly say that you know, government can work together with communities and business and nonprofits to create better outcomes for citizens. That's really our goal. We can offer the ability to network, to connect people, to create policies that take down those barriers, that create opportunities to move forward in a way that society can be created um, or, or be better in the future. We can help build those relationships. That's what government's role is. Government's role is bringing those connections together. It's conferences like this where we get the ability to meet new people and, and make new friendships and network and, and find out what things, what like interests we have and how we view the world in a way of creating change, change for everyone, whether Indigenous people or non-Indigenous, um, 
it is about better outcomes for everyone. And, and it's the role of government, especially my role, my responsibility as minister is to ensure that we are contributing in a way where we make it easier for people to thrive, for people to succeed, because that's truly what we all want for each other. We want to see everybody succeed and everybody benefit. Um, you know, I just, I, it, there's so many, I could probably talk for hours now on the benefits of social innovation and how we need to really partner together and come together. But uh, we, we really need to leverage our resources from government across business, across municipalities, like I said, transcending those boundaries and working together to create and facilitate those relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Minister. Um, what, one of the things that's really struck me about your approach and all of the uh, engagements that we've had in, in so many different uh, venues um, is, is this, the, the, the challenge and the strength of the emergence of the social innovation agenda for governments uh, is that it's generally not driven by a legislative framework. There's no social, British Columbia anyway, there's no social innovation act, right? And so there's no instruction. Um, and so it's an opportunity to listen. And uh, it's a really different uh, mask, of, uh, and it's a really different nature if the space in between government and our communities. And I've really witnessed um, your, um, I think, genuine interest in, um, in uh, doing what Stephen Hutter had invited us to do, which is to really listen, uh, and then to give voice to the strategies that are removing the barriers with your government colleagues. I've really witnessed that. Um, and I really wanted to acknowledge you and thank you for that. Uh, it's, it's an incredible amount of wisdom that it takes to, to do that and, and to be able to articulate and advocate for um, bringing those solutions to scale uh, inside your government. And, and that's crucial. We need that. We need those alliances and, and those relationships. I also wanted to thank you for uh, acknowledging the, um, the smokehouse specifically in, in Prince George. Uh, and to, just wanted to comment uh, about that for, for a minute. Um, uh, and to acknowledge that we have a, an incredible uh, leader here uh, in the room, uh, a very dear friend of mine, uh, Barbara Burkett uh, from Prince George. She's the executive director of the Friendship Center there. Um, yeah, please step. Um, so uh, the, um, the center uh, that, that Minister Stilwell was referring to, um, over 200 employees in the center and uh, and a real center of innovation in the context of um, uh, a blended bottom line, this idea of social enterprise, right? That you have social profit and you have fiscal profit and they have a third bottom line, I think, which is food security. Uh, and I'm from that territory and it's, it, it, it makes me feel um, uh, so proud and grateful to you, Barb, and to Jennifer Harrington is here as well. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you and acknowledge you in public. Barb is also a recipient of the Order of British Columbia and, um, and her uh, uh, innovative approaches in trying to relieve poverty, address food security, and create economic opportunity, I think does warrant your, your uh, reflections. And, uh, and we were very glad that you had the opportunity to go physically there and, and, and uh, to see for yourself minister uh, innovation in action and social enterprise in action. So thank you as well for, for um, bringing that to the attention of our audience here. And uh, um, I wanted to shift uh, to you, Wanik, and, and uh, uh, I want to talk about, uh, or ask you to talk about Manitoba mukluks. And uh, why Manitoba, why mukluks, and why are they so damn groovy? <laughs> Well, I just want to, like a lot of people ask me, you know, how is it that you came upon Manitoba Mukluks? Why Manitoba Mukluks? And, um, you know, I'm not from Manitoba. They automatically think I live in Manitoba. Um, so just, you know, my, my career, uh, and I never thought I would be involved with business in this level, um, you know, as an athlete. I, you know, I had a journey and it was really unique. I always tell people that one of the most um, kind of, uh, like, the biggest downer and the, busy, the coolest insight I'd ever had was when I got to the Olympics. And I realized when I got there, I was just playing against the same teams and the same girls that I played at every other tournament. It just happens to be the Olympics, and it's got a bigger you know, name to it. And what I realized, the insight that I had was that I looked behind me and I, I looked at the person I became and, and, the, and the skills I acquired and uh, just, just how I had to um, be innovative on a personal level 
to make it to the Olympics. Because, you know, at the Olympics, there's no special spot on the Olympic team for an Aboriginal person. There's no employment equity. And it's an institution uh, that is still, I guess, elite sport in Canada is still quite middle class to upper class European background people. Like, it's, it's, it's a really, you know, a lot of Native people are at that level. They don't understand. Uh, and, you know, it was a place that I really had to carve out a spot for my, for me and my identity because there was a real um, drive to conform. I was in a team sport. So this is like, you know, when you're in a team sport, anybody that plays team sports is like a team culture and there's a way that things are done and you really feel, you know, I felt really, um, like early on in my career, like I'm traveling about 18, 19 with the team and I would talk about, like, you know, my cousin who's 19 and has three babies. And my teammates would be like, what? Like automatically see in their head, oh my God, she's a slut, you know, like something like that, you know, like, and I'm thinking to myself, no, she's got three kids and she's in college and going to university and sometimes this is how we do things. She went on to become a nurse. She just had three kids by the time she was 19. It's pretty tough, right? And I just, like, I came from a different context. I came from a different understanding, worldview, family units, family roles, all these things. And all of that had to, I had, I, I felt this urge to conform, but then as I conformed and I started to shed this sort of, started to just stop talk about, talking about who I was, trying to conform to the norm, I started to play worse. And my, my fire and my, my pizzazz and my gutsiness started to, like my, my flame started to go out. And I really noticed like I, I wasn't me anymore. And I needed to be me to, to be the best that I could be. And so, you know, talking to my mom and talking to people, um, I, I, I started, like, I had to figure out how to make my culture and who I was as a Mohawk, who I was as a warrior, who I was, but make it, um, and insert it into the culture of my sport and, to, and, and, I mean, and be high functioning. And, you know, it worked. Like, I, I got to the, the Olympic level, I became the co-captain and all these things. And, um, you know, one of the things that underlay my journey was I had to learn, like I had to figure out not only to do what my teammates were doing, I had to be just as good, I had to be better just to make it. And I had to train harder. There's no such a thing as Indian time. You can't show up 15 minutes late and expect people to accept that. And I had to try harder and I had to really, I had to like go through this big kind of, it was, it was, it was a, such a growth and because I wanted to be the best in the world. And you know, when I got to the Olympics and I, I looked at what I accomplished, I was so proud of myself because no one gave it to me. And I wanted so much for more people to experience that, that sense of, I did it. And no one can look at me and go, oh yeah, well you got it because you're native. Oh, you get everything paid for. Oh, all this stuff, sorry. And, um, and it, it was just such a, and it's always been a sense of real pride and, and confidence. And so, you know, as I've, I've traveled, and one of the greatest, thing, you know, one of the, the greatest conversations I had when I got home from the Olympics was with Alan Morris. Uh, from my community who won gold in, uh, in Los Angeles, you know, we're talking and he says, okay, so you've been allowed to be really self-centered for the last like many years, now it's your turn to give back. And so that's when I started to travel and I started to, you know, really get to a wonderful opportunity. I remember I was going to like five, six different communities a week <laughs> and seeing kids and oh, it was amazing. What an honor to get a chance to do that. And um, what I always like to tell stories of is, is out-of-the-box success stories. Thanks. Out-of-the-box success stories of, of, of sick people who strive to do things that aren't necessarily the norm, right? And um, I remember walking into the longhouse in Ganawaga once and um, seeing a girl wearing these beautiful mukluks. And my first thought was, oh, another, someone knocking off our culture. But they're really pretty. So what are they? <laughs> So I went over to her and I'm like, so what are you wearing? And she's like, 
I'm wearing, oh, these are Manitoba Mucklucks, and da -da, they're an Aboriginal company, and, and I went online, and I, I looked at the company, and then I said, you know, I want to tell the story of these, this company. So I happened to be in Winnipeg, I called up the, the, the line, the 1-800 dial, I'm like, hi, my name is Winnie Corn Miller, I'd love to get to know your company more so I can tell the story. So I'm at this hotel, and they're like, okay, well, we'll send someone to pick you up. Guess who picked me up? The owner. Sean McCormick and his eight-year-old pickup truck, looking like he just got out of the bush, right? And he took me on a tour, and I just said, if there's anything I can ever do for you, I, I think we need to help each other. We need to support each other, and you reflect. Like, what I really found with Manitoba is that their goal is to take on the world footwear market. Their goal is to create a worldwide Aboriginal brand. It doesn't exist. They want to do it, but we have to, like, and, the, and, and as Sean often says, we aren't a social enterprise. We are a for-profit enterprise. We've sold two, we sell about 200,000 200, mucklucks, pairs of mucklucks a year, worldwide. We do have offshore production. We have also domestic production. So that's about $11 million in sales. And we are on the same, we're in all the stores from Holt Renfrew to Nordstrom's to, you know, to your trading post to, and in Alberta for some reason, a lot of drugstores carry our stuff, I found. <laughs> anyway, so what they, you know, what we're doing is, what we understood is that um, our company, uh, and, and what Sean understood, he's like, we had to figure out, if we did not learn to play the game and win at it, we would not survive. And if you don't win at the game, in, uh, if you can't figure out how to win the game and, and, and compete with the big boys, because like companies like Uggs are billion dollar companies and they're what our main competition is. And so we're trying to compete and we're trying to do it in a way that is Aboriginal focused because when you stick Aboriginal on your box, we are an Aboriginal brand, we all know what that means, right? You got auntie, uncle, cousin, mom who say, oh, you're Aboriginal, what are you gonna do for us? How are you involved? You know, and that is a big part of who we are as a company is, that's the, when I talk about an Aboriginal business, we have a big social responsibility. So we are a for-profit company, company with a social focus. And so what we need to do, we needed to figure out what are those rich, rich, rich guys doing? We need to do it as good, if not better than them. And with our success, we can do more in our community. But if we fail as a company, we can't help anybody. And that, was, that, that is the nature of business. And it's really important. And um, you know, I'm really proud to be part of this brand because I know from everybody from the top on down, you know, we have uh, programs like the Storyboot Project, which is a project uh, twofold. We sell uh, one-of-a-kind muckluck and moccasins uh, smoked moose hide, hand beaded, beautiful stuff. And anybody ever tan a hide in here? So you know how long that takes, right? So when you see someone selling a pair of hand, home tanned mucklucks, moose hide or caribou hide, and they sell it for 200 bucks, you know they're probably getting about a, one cent an hour, right? And if we want our culture to survive, we need to pay our artists what they're worth. So we sell their stuff on our website and through our trade shows and... <laughs> and it is my absolute pleasure, I, I, I go on the shopping channel. <laughs> How many have ever seen me on the shopping channel? <laughs> because I remember that they called me up and they were like, so Monique, um, do you want to be on the shopping channel? And I was like, they were like, yeah, well, we know, you know, like they were kind of scared to ask me and I'm like, oh my God, yeah. I have two goals. I want to be on Sesame Street and the shopping channel. <laughs> so I got to be on, I get to be on the shopping channel and I remember the first pair of, of one of a kind mucklucks we sold was for a woman, woman named Rosa Scribe. And she is a uh, old cookum, uh, Cree cookum from uh, Norway House in Manitoba, Northern Manitoba. And we sell her stuff regularly. And if you see her work, like crazy. Anybody ever seen Rosa Scribe stuff? It's like f the most beautiful floral and she makes white and they're, oh, they're unbelievable. We sell them for $1,200 a pop and she gets 100% of the proceeds. 
we sold them on the shopping channel for the first time. And I, I remember when we see, and the great thing about being on the shopping channel, you see like the numbers going down or whatever, and this many sold, and then it was like, it went across the sign, sold, as I was talking about it. And I'm like, I went up to the camera, I was like, I almost started crying. I'm like, do you know, whoever bought those, do you know what that means to that woman? Not only does what it means to, in, a, in, in some communities that have 80% unemployment, for an artist to make a $1,200 check, not only for her and her immediate family, but for the young people around her that now will look and say, maybe I want to be a muckluck artist. And it's in the similar way in which the West Coast has done it with the carvings, and the Inuit have done it with the soapstone carvings. It's about re-educating the world that it's not a craft, it is an art form, and for it to be for it to survive, it has to be economically viable. And it was funny enough, I got a, I got a text right after Almost Crying on television from my friend Suzanne Campo, who's in the legislature in Saskatchewan. She's totally native. She's like, I bought them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I thought it was a native person. <laughs> a non-native person. But anyway, so we have sold hundreds of pairs of these all over the world. And it, and, and it, is, and it is my job to tell the story of why it's important, the whole story of mukluks, and that's my job. We also have the Story Boots School, which is, uh, we launched six across the country this year, and we've been running them out of our factory here in Winnipeg, and that is having artists teach the next generation of young people how to make handmade mukluks and moccasins, and it is, it is entirely internally fundraised. And we also have, I mean, we have probably over, this year we'll have over 150 young people that know how to make from scratch, from, from, right from making the pattern and everything, and Manitoba mukluks. So those schools were at the Badashu Museum in Toronto, uh, McGill University, Carleton University, Wabano Center, Health Center in Ottawa, and UBC, and then here. And um, it is an, a wonderful experience to tell these young people that they are part of a bigger movement of cultural revitalization. And we had this one story, I'm sorry, I'm going off, but I just wanna tell you this last story about this. So normally it's young people that come out to our storyboard schools. And at Wabano, in walked these three grandmas. And they were from Manitoulin Island. And one was a great grandma. And she walked in, and I, I mean, I had kind of known her before, because she's known as like this phenomenal knitter. She's one of the people that can knit. Like she can knit you, she probably knit you your wedding gown. Like one of those incredible knitters. Everything she does is amazing. But she never learned how to make mukluks and moccasins. Neither, all three of them didn't, because they went to residential school. And they always felt like something was missing. So they came to our class, and Roberta Anderson, who made this jacket and makes a lot of the beautiful things, she went to residential school, but she also learned from her mother how to make muck, uh, mukluks. And to see them over five weeks exchanging, laughing, and, and it was like filling in the blanks. It was about these women finally learning something they never got a chance to. And at the end, they were like in tears and hugging, and it was, it just means so much to me to be part of that and to be part of a company that believes in that. And the final piece is we have an Aboriginal hiring policy at Manitoba. And the Aboriginal, Aboriginal hiring policy is not just people in the stockroom. We have head of e-commerce, head of uh, HR, finance, you know, accounting, IT. These, we, we poach totally right, right out of the, uh, the employment and training centers here, and we give them a chance, and um, they're incredible. It's an incredible workforce, and um, that's all because of you know, I really believe Sean McCormick and his family um, having this big vision and being doing it in an Aboriginal, Aboriginal way, which is completely unique to any other company. Wow, uh, thank you, Winnie. Um, I just um, I felt like closing my eyes and uh, just. Um, putting out a pulse of, of gratitude that you are describing our desired future state. That is what uh, um, decolonization and reculturalization looks like in practice in, in an economic and community development context. Um, and, uh, and that you've painted such a beautiful picture. Um, and we're hearing over the course of this uh, summit that 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 vision is materializing, the vision of our elders is materializing, and this is uh, uh, Atan Chat, the uh, former National Chief Sean Atlio says, this moment in history, this moment in history that we're in, this moment that we're in to bear witness to the change that's happening um, is, uh, um, 
we, we have an obligation to make the absolute most of that. And it sounds as though uh, you're doing exactly that in that context. I just wanted to, uh, um, I put up my hand about uh, tanning moose hide. And uh, so we, 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 we get moose every year and we bring it to Victoria. And um, so we're tanning it in the backyard and uh, the bylaw office, it's really stinky. Like for those of you who tan moose hide, it smells really bad. And we live right in Victoria and uh, the bylaw officer came to the door and he said, um, we got a complaint. I'm going to give you a citation. We got a smell complaint. You're stinking up the neighborhood, Lassert. And um, what do you got going on there? You know, and and uh, and it, and he said, so I'm going to need you to stop. So I was like, oh, just a second. And I ran upstairs and I got my copy of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And I came running back down. And I was like, Article 22, Subsection B gives me the right to do this. Like, what do you have? And he's like, I got a bylaw. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't know. You know we're tanning the hide in the backyard. I asked my daughter, Raven, who's going to be uh, up here tomorrow, um, to come out and, and tan. And she came out in a white lace dress, and she's like, I make this look good, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Raven. Um, I, we, we had been checking in uh, earlier, um, and uh, what I love about when you're hanging out in Indian country is we practice intimacy in our communities in our way all the time, into BC. And you, you, it's part of our circle of teaching is that we, just, we can just be human with each other, talk about what matters, talk about the best thing that we can do with our best self, drawing on our cultural knowledge and leaning on each other to chart a course to a better future than the past that we've had. And, and I've, I've really witnessed that with you, Minister Stilwell. And uh, I just wanted to ask you to, to comment about um, the role of, of sport uh, in your life and your own resiliency. Uh, as you've come along your, your life journey. Um, and I know that before your time in politics, you were a motivational speaker. You come from uh, Parksville, which you know, is a very uh, incredible and brilliant community in the way that it innovates. Um, and that uh, you've worked as part of the Rick Hansen Foundation. And there's just so, so many gifts that you've given back to the community to talk about uh, the, the way that sport has played a role in, in, in um, giving you the tools that you need to be successful in life. And I just wanted to see if you could share some thoughts about that. Well, I can, I can say that if it weren't for sport, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I was injured when I was 17 years old. But as a child, sport has always been a part of my life. From the time I was able to pick up a ball and run and bike and do those things that the boys were doing, I was trying to do it. Um, usually I was doing it better than them. It's always played a significant role. And when you think of sport and what it brings to one's life, you think of, you know, at first when you're young, it's about friendships and it's learning about teamwork and sharing and participation. But it's also those other skills that you gain from it. It's the strength, it's the determination, perseverance. And if I didn't have those instilled in me at a very young age, when I had my injury, I probably would have given up. Because when you have a spinal cord injury, something like myself, or a brain injury, any significant life-changing injury, uh, me specifically, it's, it's like you're a baby again. And you have to relearn everything from brushing your teeth to getting dressed, how to go to the washroom, um, how to use a chair, how to get around. And it's frustrating. And it's exhausting. And there's a grieving process of, what my life was prior to my injury. But at the same time, sport enabled me to focus on my abilities, to see what was possible, to see that there were options for me and there were doors opening everywhere I turned. It helped me realize that when a door does open and you meet that person and they make a suggestion, to not fear what might come if you try. Because the biggest failure is not trying at all. And so every time something came to me that challenged me, I became this woman who was so determined to prove that I could do it. I had family and friends who supported me, but I also had people in my life who thought I would need to be cared for for the rest of my life. They would need to push me around and, and all those day-to-day -day living things, and I just became so focused on proving to them that I didn't need them, that I could do it. 
But I also learned that I still needed the circle of people around me that enabled me to become the success. You don't become an Olympian on your own. You absolutely put the blood, sweat, and tears into every day of training, but you surround yourself with people who support you, whether it's a coach, massage therapist, a psychologist, a family member, a mom or a dad when you're younger who's driving you to and from your sporting events. Those are the people that enrich you and help you on your path to success. And I certainly know that if I didn't surround myself with those people, I wouldn't be where I am today. But I honestly didn't ever think I would be where I am today. It wasn't my lifelong dream to be a minister, <laughs> politician. Door opened, opportunity came, and I took the challenge. Because my whole life, I have always tried to help people. And I have always used my voice to make sure that change is happening. When I saw something that I didn't like, I would speak up. Some people wished I wouldn't. <laughs> but I don't fear those things. We can't fear those things. When you see something that needs to change and you don't believe it's being done right, it's our roles as human beings, as a society coming together, to speak up and try to make change, to make life better for all of us. Thank you, Minister. So we're just uh, coming to the end of our, our time uh, with this panel. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, add um, uh, in, in Minister Stilwell's uh, community, Parksville, another uh, uh, social enterprise example. Um, so the economy is changing and the middle class, the buying power of the middle class is going down. The wages are staying the same, expenses are going up, the cost of food is going through the roof, it's crazy. And we can't, it's hard to stretch our dollar, all of us, wherever you're at, um, uh, as far as we used to. And so people are shopping less in department stores, the expensive clothes, the affordability of that. And the secondhand um, clothing market is exploding. And so in the community of Parksville, there's um, Parksville Community Services Society uh, started a clothing, secondhand clothing uh, store uh, called SOS. Um, and they just finished doubling their square footage. And after five years of operation, their net, net income of own source revenue to be able to augment social services in the community was $1.2 million after expenses. And their business model is like you see at the hospital. Um, people come in, they volunteer for two hour shifts, using their volunteers in a different way than we traditionally do in, in Indian country for nonprofits. We usually use our volunteers, invite them into a space of board governance um, or soup, food, food security. Um, and so shifting that paradigm a little bit uh, was really um, brilliant uh, and um, so, uh, so you're, you come from a community, obviously, that, that you've uh, been a leader in and, and really been surrounded by innovation. Um, was there any last thoughts that you wanted to share as any of this relates to, to commerce or anything in, in, the, in that context? Well, I think part of it, too, is the partners for social impact that make a huge difference for for British Columbia, where we have 150 different business nonprofits, leaders around British Columbia who come together and share those ideas and really um, gave government 11 recommendations and we have now taken those recommendations and made some changes to help support. So it just goes back to that grassroots kind of development. We have to make sure we're keeping the lines of communication open with the people on the ground who are living it every day. The Society for Organized Services in Parksville is truly the largest social innovation that I know of that is so successful in British Columbia. Um, I know uh, I, I like to purge, so I drop off all my things at the thrift store on a monthly basis. But to, to be able to uh, have that revenue stream, $1.2 million, that goes right back into our community for different social programs to help, after school programs to help uh, support women who are fleeing abuse, uh, programs that help feed and um, shelter the homeless and, and those who are finding it difficult to make ends meet. It's, it truly is a community-based group who, who make it happen. We're never going to be able to have a government come in and say, this is how we have to do it across the board. Every single community 
has different needs, desires, different demographics, and it has to come from the ground up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I guess I can um, say now then that uh, the province of British Columbia had 11 recommendations for social innovation, became our social innovation agenda, and recommendation number nine was develop an Aboriginal social innovation agenda and engage in that relational space. And the minister is here because we are implementing recommendation number nine of our 11 recommendations to implement a social innovation agenda here to listen and build relationships. And that's exactly, I think, what success looks like in this space. So thank you so much, Minister, for being here again. And thank you, you for having uh, me. Monique, any, any last thoughts? Uh, well, I mean, one of the things that, um, that like, that's really inst like hammered into me by Sean and by everybody at Manitoba Mucklux is about um, how we never see other um, Aboriginal business as competition. Like it's, it's really about, okay, how can we leverage our brand to support other brands and things like that? And, um, you know, really like, I, and, and I mean, to be reminded all the time that the most important part of being Indigenous or being Aboriginal is how you contribute back to the community. And you know, hiring, for instance, a, a company like Manitoba and having, we, we are doing well, we're growing at like, like a drastic rate, like 30%. And so we hire, we just recently hired um, one of the best CEOs in the country, or COOs in the country. And Sean sits on a whole bunch of boards in Winnipeg, and, and one of them is a, is a social enterprise called a recycling enterprise. And they're in need of some operational support. So what did he do? He sent down his world-class, very highly paid COO and said, help them. And that's how you know we can all work together to help each other. It's like, how can we help? What can we do? And it doesn't cost us anything other than and he's happy to do it, and, and we just, we're all rising together. We, and, I, and it just brings me back to um, the teachings about uh, pr uh, power. And I mean, this is the last thing I wanna say is that, you know, I, you know when I went into the sport world, it, it really is a world where it's like top-down pyramid, right? And the most powerful person at the top. And, and in a mainstream culture, it's all about, power is about you know, COO of a company or a president or something, and how many people they control. Look, they have 20,000 employees, they're so powerful. And what I love about Indigenous people and our, our, our philosophy, which is really important when we talk about social innovation, is your power is going to be gauged by how many people you empower to be their best. And that is being Indigenous. And um, I think that we can't ever forget that teaching as we grow and as we strive is that we need to make sure we bring our community with us. Thank you. So uh, you can see now why it was so humbling to be up here and uh, sit between these two incredible women. Um, and I want to try a little something here. Um, so you have both uh, given so much. You both have given so much selflessly and because it's who you are. And uh, I want to try a practice here um, to give back to you a little bit, to fill up your cups a little bit. Um, and so, uh, if you can put your microphone down, if you're, uh, everything is okay. No, that's cool. Uh, yeah. um, and so, on the West Coast, we have um, like this. Uh, so, this is receiving. You see our, our, our uh, totems on the West Coast. Our poles are like this. So, this is uh, also to open to receive, um, but it's also that international symbol of, of hello, I'm open, like this, you know. And um, so, you may be used to this. Uh, but you might not be used to it from uh, brothers and sisters, relatives now that we have in this space um, to receive. So what I'm gonna invite you to do in a second uh, is to uh, leap up out of your chairs and give these two incredible, incredible women, thank, thank the creator that it's women who have gotten us to this point and it's women who will lead us into the future. Um, and uh, to offer a 10 second standing ovation, like really go for it, okay? <laughs> really mean it um, and send them your love and gratitude uh, because these two have done an incredible amount of giving in their life and it's okay to receive a little bit too. So you ready? Everybody ready? You got all your stuff down, you ready? 10 seconds and let's really give her, okay? Okay. 